All right, so now we're going to get into some of the really interesting and applicable applicable portions of, of microbiology. I think you're going to find this uh, very useful. <clears throat> um, it's easy to think about ourselves as kind of a discrete standalone organism, but we're actually housing a whole colony of non-harmful uh, most of the time, occasionally harmful, microorganisms. So we, we have colonies of microorganisms that live in us and on us. Humans and other mammals have the form and physiology that they have due to having been formed, those things being formed in an intimate contact with their microbes. So they, they perform actually some really important functions. Uh, and the more we learn about them, the more we understand that uh, they're important. Okay, so the human microbiome is the sum total of all of the microbes found on and in a normal human. Okay, so that means somebody that's healthy, and no, no illnesses, none of the uh, harmful bacteria, etc. Um, so they are critically healthy, uh, critically important to the health and functioning of the host organism, whether that's human beings or some or some other organisms. And we're finding out every day even how much more important they are than we once or ever, ever thought. All right, so interestingly enough, we actually have more microbes in our body than we have of our own human cells, okay, which is just crazy weird. All right. So for the most part, a resident microbiota colonize us for the long term. Uh, they do not cause disease, um, but they, they live in us. Um, so if we encounter some transient microbes, then those may cause infection. Or if the, if those pathogens get uh, past our host defenses, enter the tissues and multiplies. Okay. Or if we happen to be immunocompromised, if we have something where they the normal microbiota get out of bounds, so to speak, or if they get in the wrong place. Okay, so uh, let's see. Um, the cumulative effects of, of this infection that I was talking about a minute ago, if those uh, organisms get past our host defenses, is going to cause damage in a pathologic state. All right. Um, and so then we would call that an infectious disease. And so vocabulary, of course, is very important. Um, I've probably stated that several times. We have terms that we use in our everyday language that actually have a bit of a different meaning when we look at them scientifically. So even if you're familiar with the term, be sure that you always look at what the textbook definition is of the term. Okay, so an infection is when the microbe actually gets past host defenses, enters tissues, and multiplies. And it's not just the presence of a microbe, okay, because like we've already said, we have many that are supposed to be there. Disease is any deviation from a healthy status, a pathologic state that results when we have, like we already said, those cumulative effects um, from infection that can damage or disrupt tissues and organs. And then, of course, an infect infectious disease is the a pathogenic state caused directly by microorganisms or their products. So the human microbiome. Uh, project has been underway for many years now, since about 2008, and they, this is where they track, categorize, and characterize the microbes that normally live on human bodies, okay, what is supposed to be there. This is really important because how do we know when we have something that's not supposed to be there if we don't know what is normally there? So if you take a culture of skin, perhaps, um, you're going to have several different microbes growing there, and you need to know which ones are supposed to be there because if they're supposed to be there, then they're not harmful to us, okay? Um, <clears throat> anyway, so we've studied the human microbiome. We wanted to see what's normal. We want to compare uh, situations. Um, how does it, is it different when we have a disease status? Um, and we use things like genome sequencing um, and other tools where we get lots and lots of data. And so interesting things have come out of that. Um, in human cells, we have 21,000 protein encoding gene, genes. For microbiota, there is 8 million protein coding genes. That's actually quite a bit comparatively. Uh, microbes are found in locations where we previously thought they were sterile, clean. They were not able to be in there. Um, a hundred 
million viruses are found per one gram of human feces, which is crazy. Um, so all healthy people seem to have um, potentially dangerous pathogens in low numbers. So often it's going to have to be that we have what we call a portal of entry where they gain access somewhere where they shouldn't be, or you have, like I said, a lowered Im immunological state. Um, and for some reason, they're able to increase the numbers to an unhealthy status. Okay. So the makeup of your own intestinal biota can actually influence overall health. And there's lots and lots of research in this area right now. You'll see if you just search gut health in uh, on Google, you will find all kinds of stuff, all kinds of products with prebiotics and probiotics and all kinds of things about our gut biome and how it actually can uh, affect your overall organismal health. OK. Um, and so we found things like it being related to Crohn's disease. Uh, it can be related to obesity, heart disease, asthma, autism, diabetes, uh, even moods. They have found links with some of these things. And we'll talk about this later on with uh, diseases like schizophrenia. OK, so there's still so much more we have to learn about this. It's just really kind of fascinating. So the human body's got a lot of uh, a huge variety of environmental niches. OK, so that that's going to be areas, little micro environments where we have variations in temperature, pH, nutrients, um, oxygen, those sorts of things. And so this can support a wide range of microbiota. Normal microbiota are going to include bacteria, protozoans, fungi and viruses. OK, so we have these things naturally. All right. Um, and so here are some of the sites that we've known for a long time that have microbiota, your skin, of course, your mucous membranes, upper respiratory tract, GI tract, mouth, urethra, genitalia. Uh, even your eyes, okay? Um, we have recently discovered that we have some normal microbiota in the lower respiratory tract, bladder, breast, and breast milk, amniotic fluid, and even in the fetus, all right? Um, and actually, some um, microbiota have been associated with the early rupture of membranes um, in pregnancy, all right? So that's going to be tied to maybe with them being in that amniotic fluid. Fluid. Um, so we have found DNA from microbiota, even in the brain and the bloodstream. And so we're still learning so much about these guys. Uh, microbial antagonism is something we're going to be looking about and thinking about. Um, and this is one of the major portions of importance of our normal microbiota. What is antagonism? Well, the way I like to phrase it is if you have people living in a house, right? If you've got all these little houses and somebody wants to move in, they've got to find a vacant house, right? They got to have a house. They got to have food, um, those types of things. So if you have normal microbiota living in an area, then they're taking up resonance, they're taking up space, and they're taking up nutrients. Uh, they, uh, so they are preventing someone else from having nutrients. There's only so much food available. There's only so many houses available, okay? And so they're very beneficial to us in that manner because then it's harder for other microbiota to come in and take up residence. They have to have a food source, and if there's not much food to go around, you're not going to have a bunch of people moving in, right? If there's not any houses open, they can't come in, okay? Um, not only that, their metabolism, many microbiota uh, bacteria especially, put off products that are, um, well, make an area inhospitable, so to speak. Sometimes they're toxic to other organisms, and sometimes they just kind of make you not want to be around. You know, maybe it's it's uh, methane they're producing, and so they make it a little more inhospitable uh, for other microbes to want to be around it, okay? And so there, there's a limited number of attachment sites, all right? That's the housing. Um, chemical and physiological environment created by resident biota is hostile to other microbes. That's their, their byproducts that they are putting off as part of their metabolism. So normal microbiota are antagonistic or unfriendly to uh, new neighbors moving in. Um, and they're beneficial to us um, most of the time. At worst, they're commensal, which means that they are um, not harming or helping, but many times they are beneficial to us. We have a microbiota that actually produce vitamin K in our gut. Very important. Okay. 
So as I said earlier, uh, many times disease happens or uh, these microbiota are able to overpopulate or new ones come in and take up residence due to having an immunocompromised system, okay? So these are some of those factors that actually can weaken our host defenses, our immunity, okay, um, and increase susceptibility to infection. And we're going to look at what host defenses really are uh, in this unit. Um, and so, of course, being very, very young or very, very old on those spectrums, you're going to be more susceptible, okay. Um, the very young haven't built up their immunity yet. We have two types of immunity, one you're born with and one you kind of have to gain along the way. And so they haven't gained much along the way yet. Uh, when we're older, many of our cells are not functioning properly anymore, and so that includes our immune system, so our immune system isn't going to be functioning quite as well anymore. Uh, genetic defects and immunity. So perhaps perhaps you don't make T cells, okay? Perhaps you, perhaps you have um, one of these immune system diseases, and we'll look at those later on in the... Uh, in the uh, semester, okay? Uh, something like AIDS, chronic immune deficiency syndrome. Having surgery or an organ transplant, your body is using energy for one, to heal, and second, you are cutting through our first line of defense. You're making what we call a portal of entry, a bypass into an area that they can normally not get in because that first line of defense is gonna be your skin and tegumentary system. And so you are making an opening big wide opening where there wasn't one before, okay? Having underlying disease, okay? Things like cancer, liver, diabetes, that is going to um, affect your ability of your immune system to function properly. Chemotherapy, so remember chemotherapy is medications. So particularly if you are on things like steroids or other immunosuppressive drugs. Physical and mental stress, that's actually a really big one, okay? You'd be surprised how much stress can lower your immune system pregnancy, um, and then of course having other infections. All right, so we mentioned uh, the very young before and how they are born with some of their immunity. Um, and so where do they get this from? Um, until recently, the uterus and the contents were thought to be sterile. All right, so during uh, embryonic and fetal development, um, we've actually analyzed the stools of newborns um, that is sampled before their first meal, which is the meconium, which is their first stool. And it actually shows that they already have bacteria in their stool. Okay, we all have bacteria in our stool, but if it was ster a sterile environment, then those babies have to be getting um, these microbiota from somewhere. Okay, these bacteria from somewhere. So this indicates or tells us that their intestines are already colonized by bacteria in the uterus. Okay, um, this is an important source of microbiota. Um, well, an important source, sorry, for, for microbiota for newborn is actually the trip through the vagina. They're going to pick up lots of microbiota there. We'll talk later on about some that are not beneficial that, that we don't want them to pick up, but then there are some beneficial ones they need to pick up. Um, lactobacillus uh, provides the baby with the necessary enzymes to digest milk. All right, they need to be able to digest milk. So that is an important bacterial species they need to have. Other species protect the baby from skin disorders or other conditions. Uh, human milk itself has about 600 species of bacteria and the sugars the baby cannot ingest, but that are digested by healthy gut bacteria. Okay, now don't think, ooh, bacteria bad. These are good, healthy bacteria, okay? The baby needs these. So where do babies get micro, their microbiome from? All right, so in utero, like we said, we thought the, the uh, uterus was sterile. The womb had its, uh, the womb actually, we have found out, has its own microbiota. During birth, we already mentioned um, going through the vagina. Um, C-section birth even still contributes, but they do give different initial microbiomes to the baby, okay? Um, because you're coming through a different area, right? Um, so milk, breast milk, we already said. Um, formula even has different microbiomes in them, but they do have some. Um, you're going to get them from caregivers. Your family is going to give you some just by holding and touching you. Your, your mother, your father, your siblings, anybody that is in contact with a baby is actually sharing part of their normal microbiota with the baby, okay? 
Uh, and so just even also in the environment. And so the baby can pick up microbes from anything they come into contact with. And as they're good, getting older, you know, they come in contact with everything. This is actually very healthy. We tend to get a little too overprotective um, in this day and time when it comes to our babies. Um, and we have found when you when you mess with things with Mother Nature, you tend to screw them up. You know, they used to tell us for a long time um, they had all these requirements about uh, don't feed children peanut butter before this age, don't do this, don't do that. And then we saw this huge increase in allergies to peanuts, okay, because they weren't exposed at an early age. And so exposure to normal bacteria is not necessarily a bad thing. It's a good thing. They're building up their immune system. So am I saying let them go out and play in filth? No. Uh, but don't, don't be... Um, hyper vigilant where they never get to pick up any normal microbiota either. A little dirt never hurt anybody, right? <laughs> All right, pathogenicity. This is a broad concept that deals with or describes the ability to cause disease. Uh, we're going to categorize microbes into two groups. True pathogens, which are also called primary pathogens, those can cause disease in a healthy person with a healthy intact immune system. And then opportunistic, and this is what I was talking about earlier. If your immune system is low or if the bacteria or other microbes gets in an area that they are not normal residents of, that is an opportunistic um, infection. Okay, an example of this would be uh, Candida albicans or pseudomonas. So let's talk about Candida. If you were taking antibiotics, especially us females, okay, we're on antibiotics. What is something we have to watch out for? We have to watch out for those yeast infections, right? Because the antibiotics are killing um, off some of the normal microbiota, uh, but they're not killing off Candida. So all of a sudden there's more housing and more food available. And so the Candida albicans, which is a normal resident, okay, of our uh, reproductive system uh, can overgrow and cause a yeast infection, okay, that is opportunistic. Virulence is basically telling us how pathogenic a microorganism can be. This is determined by two factors, the ability to establish itself into the host and cause damage. Um, to be established, a microbe has to gain entry. You got to have a portal of entry. You got to have a way to get in there, okay? Then it's also got to be able to attach itself to the host so that it doesn't get flushed out. And it's got to be able to compete with the other um, critters in the microbiome, right? It's got to find a niche, okay? Uh, then it also has to be able to survive some of our host defenses. So in order to cause damage, the microbe must be able to produce a toxin and cause injury to the host. That is going to contribute to its virulence, okay? How virulent is it? Um, it's got to be established and it's got to be able to cause damage. And to cause damage, it's usually going to be producing a toxin or somehow physically injure the host. Any characteristic or part of a microbe that continues um, these activities is what we call a virulence factor. Later on, we're going to, to discuss Koch's postulates. These are very important in isolating and identifying which organism is the cause of an infection. Um, and this is important because we do have so many normal microbiota in existence that are in and on our body, okay? And so we can also have what we call a polymicrobial infection, okay? That means we have, poly means many, and so we have many microbes or several microbes causing an infection, all right? So an example of this is if you have influenza, which is a virus, uh, and then you get a secondary infection, which is going to be pneumonia, and that would be caused by a bacterium. All right, so that's an example um, of that there. If you have uh, staph and strep on the skin, that can cause an infection. Um, if you have uh, mor 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 I can never say that right, moraxella, they can also increase the virulence of the staph and strep. Okay, and so the three of those together can lead symptoms.
All right, so we've talked a little bit about portals of entry. Uh, in order to cause an infection, microorganisms need a way to get around host defenses. And we're going to learn all about these host defenses in this host defenses in this unit, okay? So for us, our first line of defense, like I said, is the skin. They need an avenue to get around it. That is a portal of entry. So a portal of entry um, textbook definition, you want to say, is the route that a microbe takes to enter the tissues of the body in order to initiate an infection okay we can classify this as being exogenous or endogenous okay so exo think exit endo think inside all right Ex exogenous if you want to say it that way um, the microbe is origi originating from a source outside the body from the environment or another person or animal if it is endogenous okay uh, microbe is already existing in or on our body. It is normal microbiota or a previously silent, uh, silent infection, okay, that has somehow overgrown, all right? So sometimes um, these microbiota can also enter by more than one particular portal. The majority of pathogens have adapted to a specific portal of entry, but some of them, like we said, uh, can enter by more than one area. Certain pathogens, if they enter the wrong portal, will not be infections. For example, if you have an inoculation, and remember an inoculation just means insertion of a microbe, okay? So if they're entering the nasal muc mucosa with influenza, then the virus will take root and you'll get the flu. But if you come in contact with the skin only, for influenza, then no infection, infection will occur, okay? Um, so some of the examples here are about some of these guys that could come into several places, and when we get into the units on systems, we'll talk about what their portals of entry are, uh, and so that's going to be something really important to keep track with. Uh, but like streptococcus and staphylococcus can enter through the skin, the urogenital tract, or the respiratory tract, so they have more than one way to gain entrance. These are some of the common portals of entry. Um, if I have not mentioned it already, I would take all of these bacteria that we talk about, I would make a flashcard for each of them, and I would start keeping track of information. So for instance, you could make a Staphylococcus aureus flashcard, okay? And right now, what you could put on it is it has a portal of entry for the skin, okay? Now, how it is gained, um, you know, maybe things like insect bites, but for if, if the portal of injury is the skin, Staph aureus to me, that's kind of obvious that it's gonna have to have a break in the skin. But if it's not obvious to you, go ahead and put that on the card. And then you'll keep these cards all semester long and add to them every unit. And then you will have yourself a really good study tool uh, for the final, okay? Um, and keep reviewing these as you go. Um, and what is really also helpful is if you will color code them. All right, and when I say color code, I don't mean just use different co colors. I mean, so if it is gram positive or gram negative, you're definitely gonna wanna identify that, okay? And so make one purple, one pink <laughs> for the name, perhaps. Uh, and if you make this up yourself, it works much better. And so like for portal of entry, you could make all portal of entry information green, okay? Um, something like that. Find something that works for you, but it has to have a purpose and it will help you to remember that information better. It's taking advantage of your own uh, brain neurology, okay? Um, so anyway, you could also make a card and put all of the pathogens that infect the respiratory tract if you wanted to do that as well, okay? Uh, but I would definitely make one about for each of the particular bacteria names and start putting their information on them. Get you one of those little rings, punch a hole in them, or buy you one with the spirals. That way you have a good way to keep up with it. Just a temp, uh, tip. I'm not going to read all this to you because you can read, but this is definitely an important uh, graphic here to study. Okay, time for another NCLEX prep uh, question here. Um, and this is, of course, application of our information. And Epidemiology RN is analyzing the prevalence of infectious disease in an immunocompromised patient's population. So what is the difference between a true pathogen and an opportunistic pathogen? So really, this, that's all this is really asking you. What is a true pathogen? What is a, an opportunistic pathogen? So A, true pathogens cause a disease in the presence of an immunocompromised host. Whereas true opportunistic pathogens do not. B, opportunistic pathogens develop virulence properties within an immunocompromised host. 
whereas true pathogens do not. Sorry, there's a typo there. The disease associated with true pathogens may vary in presentation, ranging from mild to severe infections, where opportunistic pathogens are always present in severe form. Or D, true pathogens cause disease in healthy individuals, whereas opportunistic pathogens typically cause disease in an immunocompromised host. So pause this for a minute, get your answer. The correct answer here is D. A healthy uh, individual can get a true pathogen. An opportunistic one has to have an immunocompromised host. Hope you got that right. All right, so how do we quantify numbers of microbes? So that basically you know, where you, when you hear quantify, think quantity, that's number. Um, and then if we talk about qualitative, you think quality, and that's going to be anything that's not a number, okay? So something descriptive, color, that type of thing. So something else that's important here to consider in value, evaluating infection is to know how many microbes the initial or inoculating dose has. That is really important because that tells us how severe is the disease. How many microbes do we need to kill, which is directly related to the uh, time Time and amount dose of medication. Sorry. Okay. Um, and so let's see. Uh, most microbes have a minimum number of microbes that are needed to cause an infection. So you can have a small amount um, without getting sick. All right. So this is what we call the infectious dose. How many uh, microorganisms, microorganisms do you need to have in order to cause infection, okay? So some um, examples here are, um, well, first off, if the numbers are below the infectious dose or, or, I'm sorry, inoculating dose or ID, you do not usually get an infection. So let's say, for instance, you take a urine sample. It's not uncommon to find a few white blood cells in a urine sample. That does not mean an infection. You have to have a certain amount, okay? Um, so if it is far greater than the inoculating dose, then the onset of the illness may be very, very rapid. You get sick very, very quickly. Okay, so the ID for Q fever is one cell. <laughs> That's pretty virulent. Okay, tuberculosis, coccidiomycosis, GR GR giardias is about 10 cells, not very many. Gonorrhea, you need about 1,000. Typhoid fever, 10,000. Cholera, uh, a million, a lot, okay? Um, so that's really important information. So we said in order to cause infections, microbes had to, one, gain entry, okay? So once they gain entry, then they have to become established. They have to find a way to get attacked and not be flushed out, okay? This is going to depend, <coughs> excuse me, on the binding between the molecules of the host and the molecules of the pathogen. So this makes the pathogen limited to particular cells and organisms to which it can attack. I'm sorry, attach. <laughs> so firm attachment is almost always a requirement for causing disease. So since the body has so many mechanisms for flushing microbes from tissues, uh, bacteria, fungi, and protozoans have methods that they use like having fimbrae, having those surface proteins, slimes, and capsules to help them stay attached. Viruses have special receptors that they use to gain entrance, uh, and parasites have lovely things like suckers, hooks, and barbs, okay? And I'll probably show you some pictures of those later on. It's kind of, if you look at these things close up with a microscope, it's almost uh, kind of the things in nightmares. <laughs> They're really scary looking, okay? Um, and so anyway, it's pretty interesting. We have all these different mechanisms of staying put. So once you find a way to get your foot in the door and find you a place to live, you've got to be able to survive the host defenses. We have special defenses that we have in our body that help us to fight these things off. Microbes that are not normal microbiota are going to uh, encounter resistance from the host, um, especially from phagocytes, okay? Phagocytes are cells that engulf and destroy host 
pathogens. Uh, they use enzymes and antimicrobial chemicals, okay? Phago means uh, eat, basically, and cyte means cell. So phagocytosis is cell eating, all right? Um, microbes can have some antiphagocytic factors which help them avoid phagocytosis. So some of those that are more virulent uh, are able to avoid these. They have to be able to avoid these, actually, to be able to uh, stay uh, and cause an infection. Some also have what we call leukocytins. Side, C-I-D-E, means to kill, okay? And so these actually will kill the phagocytes before they can even do their job, all right? So there are virulence factors. We already said um, having the antiphagocytic factors, being able to kill them. Uh, having a slime layer or capsule which prevents phagocytosis. These are some virulence factors that makes pathogens more virulent. So next they've got to cause disease. We're talking about virulence factors. These are actually just adaptations that a microbe has that helps it to establish itself in the host, allowing them to gain entry and become established, okay? Um, effects of these actually can vary a lot. Um, some can cause a little bit of damage and some, like we already said, actually kill the hosts, which is not beneficial to the microbe if they kill the host. They really don't want to kill the host. So there are three ways that microorganisms damage their host. First, one is going to be directly through the action of enzymes or toxins, sometimes both, uh, endotoxins and exotoxins. So here in the top left in this picture, we're seeing disruption of the host cell structures, okay, or the connections between cells. And so that's what's going on in this area right here. So they break through this glue holding these cells together and gain entry, okay. Um, they also can uh, indirectly work by inducing the host defenses to respond uh, with too large of a, a response of inflammation. Inflammation is designed to help us, but too much inflammation, inflammation can actually, sorry, I cannot get whatever this is off my glasses. Too much inflammation can actually be deadly. You can actually have what we call a cytokine storm. Cytokines are chemical messengers and they are designed, uh, part of their job anyway, is to ramp up inflammation. And so things like influenza and with our current SARS-2 COVID-19 um, version of the coronavirus, um, this cytokine storm is a huge factor and sometimes is what actually kills the patient instead of the disease itself. It's their own immune system response that is overreacting. Okay, and so that's what we are seeing over here in um, actually right here, um, where the host defenses actually do damage instead of the infection. Um, so then we have products that the microbes can make that make what we call epigenetic. Epi means above, so changes to the DNA outside of normal DNA structure, um, or they can they can cause uh, problems with the histone proteins, and so they actually alter, alter the host gene expression, okay? Uh, and that's what we have here in the epigenetic changes on the host DNA. Um, actually, no, this is actually the picture of the exotoxins harming um, these cells here by, by getting rid of cells, actually part of A. Uh, and so I guess there's no picture here for, for um, C. Yes, this is it right here. All right, so here we've got our bacteria. We've got histone modification. If, if the histones don't work, the DNA cannot uh, coil itself up, so it can't be replicated. So basically you're interfering with metabolism, all right? DNA methylation, that is a post-translation process where we add methyl groups to the end. We kind of like put little pieces on the end after we make something. And so, like I said, basically what that means is it's interrupting the metabolism. Many pathogenic microbes secrete exoenzymes that are damaging to tissues or help avoid those host barriers, those lines of defenses. So remember, an enzyme is going to end in ASC, and it often tells you what it does or what it works on. 
Uh, we have some examples here of some enzymes. We have mucinase. So mucinase is going to be working on mucous membranes. Okay, so this actually digests the outer coating of mucous membranes. So this helps evade our first line of defense. All right, hyaluronidase. This actually digests hyaluronic acid, which is part of that glue I said that helps hold animal cells together. This is a really important virulence factor for staphylococci, clostridia, streptococci, or pneumonia cocci. Coagulase, what is coagulation? All right, this causes coagulation or blood clotting. Um, and this is produced by staphylococci, so they can actually cause blood clotting. Kinases, like streptokinase and staphylokinase, do the exact opposite. They dissolve fibrin clots. So basically, if you have a big wound, your body has produced this fibrin clot. Um, and we think that it's only to stop the bleeding, but it's also designed to shut off that door. So you close that portal of entry. Well, if they divide, di dissolve that, then they're able to get through. Okay. Um, and so that's that's a pretty good little tool there. And so these are exoenzymes. And so these are enzymes that are secreted by microbes that break down um, defenses or inflict damage on the tissue. And their, their whole purpose here is to break down our defenses and help them to get around things. So toxins also are named according to their target. So that's pretty handy, okay? What types of toxins do bacteria have? Well, first off, a toxin is a specific chemical product of a microbe that is poisonous to other microorganisms, okay? Um, or other organisms, organisms in general. Sorry, not just microorganisms. So it's named according to its target. Neurotoxin works on the nervous system. Entero uh, is referring to intestines, and so enterotoxins act on the intestines. Hemotoxins, think hemoglobin or heme. Heme is referring to red blood cells. Nephrotoxin, nephro, nephron is going to be referring to kidneys, all right? Really important to kind of know what it is going to be affecting because this is what drives symptoms. So exotoxins are proteins and they can have a deadly effect on their target cells. They damage cell membrane, cause lysis or disrupt intracellular functions. That's between cells. Hemolysins are a bacterial exotoxin. So heme and lice, let's break that down. Heme we know refers, refers to red blood cells, okay? Lysin is lysis. And when you hear lysis, I want you to think loosen. The red blood cells are going to to rupture. So these actually burst um, red blood cells and they can release hemoglobin pigment. Okay. Now that part is important for, for being able to identify things. All right. So it makes pathogens like Streptococcus pyogenes, uh, some forms of Staphylococcus aureus, more pathogenic. Um, Beta hemolysis is showed here in what we call, uh, well, I'm sorry, in the lower right hand, okay? This results in a clearing of the red blood cells. This is blood agar here in a, in a Petri plate, and we have streaked it with some uh, bacteria. And so beta hemolysis is in this area here. This gives us a completely clear uh, area. The red blood cells are gone completely, okay? Alpha is here on the lower left, and that's incomplete lysis of red blood cells. Alpha and beta are just referring to different toxins produced by Staphylococcus aureus. So this test and pattern of hemolysis is, uh, hemolysis is used to identify bacteria and determine how virulent they are. So obviously this one that is killing more red blood cells is going to be more virulent, right? This portion here looks like it's the control because you still have lots of red blood cell growth there. Um, exotoxins also, ha also have many different examples, um, but endotoxins are one substance, okay? So there are many exotoxins. You can have gram-positive and gram-negative produce those. Exotoxins, however, are one thing, and they are strictly gram-negative, and they are why gram-negative infections are particularly problematic, okay? Um, they have a lipopolysaccharide, or LPS, that is part of their outer membrane uh, of the gram-negative cell walls only. So gram 
negative bacteria shed these off when they die. So this is why dilution is the solution for pollution. All right, reduce the numbers of gram negative bacteria before chemotherapy happens. That is vitally important. This is also why many times a patient will go in the hospital, they will get treatment, and they will actually begin to get worse because as you are killing the bacteria, you are releasing this uh, toxin, this endotoxin. Sorry, I had to think about it. It was endo exo for a minute. This endotoxin, and you're going to have a variety of systemic effect, effects on tissues and organs, fever, inflammation, hemorrhaging, diarrhea, and even gram-negative shock, which can be fatal. So it is really important to be able to explain this to patients and so that they understand. I can't tell you the number of people that I have seen saying, well, I took such and such to the hospital, they treated them, and they only got worse. And so it always makes me wonder, well, do they have a gram negative infection because they need to be educated that things may get worse before they get better all right this is also why things like debridement or cleaning a wound are so important you want to pull out and reduce the numbers of bacteria as much as you can all right a good example of this was uh, one time and a lot of times you don't get as many of these examples as my classroom students do they get tired of hearing them but I feel like a true life example helps you to understand apply um, and remember it, okay. Um, I had a horse, a uh, first horse that I had that had a baby. It was her first baby, and of course, she's a drama queen, so she had some problems. Uh, she re had a retained placenta, so after she delivered the colt, um, she had a little bit of stress, and I won't go into all those details, but she did not deliver her placenta. Um, for something like a cow, it's not that big of a deal, but for a horse, it's a big deal. Uh, and so my vet was uh, tied up and we had talked about everything except what to do when something went wrong, which we should have known with this horse that it was going to go wrong. Um, and so it took me a while to get a vet out to see her. And so she had this retained placenta for, gosh, hours. And one hour is about as long as I can go. All right. And we tried everything. Um, so anyway, she had that retained placenta. Well, the vet came out. Um, what is the first thing she does? Well, she does lavage. Lavage is where they're going to flush. So she flushed out her uterus to reduce the numbers of bacteria, okay? Um, well, actually, first she had to uh, remove the placenta, which came out pretty easily by then, but still yet the damage was done. Then she performed lavage and reduced those numbers and put her on two different antibiotics, okay? So uh, all is well and good. I wrote a nice big check for that. Uh, a couple of days later, I come home and this horse is absolutely burning up. I mean, I can feel the heat coming off of her. She had a hundred and eight and still actually counting when I was on the phone with the vet hospital. I had to take her back to the hospital. They had to keep her for three days. They had to do more lavage. They had to do more antibiotics and and it was it was a whole thing she had a gram negative infection had i not had the vet out that night she would have gone into this gram negative shock which would have likely killed her okay so gram negative infections are nothing to play around with and it is very important that people understand this uh, as, as, so you're killing these bacteria and so then they're they're shedding those cell walls and that's going to cause symptoms and it's going to cause it it to actually sometimes get worse before it gets better uh blood infections by salmonella shigella uh, neisseria meningitidis these guys can cause this gram negative shock e coli is also particularly dangerous this is why and, and some of you may be too young to remember we had a huge e coli outbreak i believe this one was actually with hamburger meat and it was killing kids it was killing kids because they would get this gram negative shock and it would destroy it was destroying their their kidneys I believe if I remember correctly big problem okay also again like I said you've got to be able to explain to patients because if the patient sees their family member get worse and they don't understand why what are they going to do they're going to move them which is usually the worst thing they need to do all right so uh, exotoxins are given off by live cells they have specific targets and effects um, and they only need a small amount to be a problem they're generally specific to a general tissue 
they can be converted to a toxoid. A toxoid is what we use in vaccines. So you can um, get a vaccine to prevent it. An antitoxin is what we give. It's an antibody that we give after you've been exposed. Okay. So um, in exotoxins, remember, these can be gram positive, usually sometimes gram negative. All right. And so these things I'm listing out, this is really important for you to know the difference between exotoxins and endotoxins. And I will harp on this for the rest of the semester. Okay. Got to know this. All right. Um, and so secreted from gram positive and sometimes gram negative. All right. Endotoxins, and these names are kind of counterintuitive. To me, it seems like an endotoxin should be the name for one, and exo they should be split. Exotoxin you're shedding off sounds like that should is what it should be, but it's not. So I just have to remember the names are backwards. Okay, so hopefully that will help you. It may not seem backwards to you, then just ignore that. All right. But if they feel backwards to you, then you just have to remember it's opposite. Okay. So endotoxins are strictly gram negative only. They're part of the cell wall. So when those bacteria disintegrate, that is when you're going to have the effects. Okay. You need the toxin in a large quantity to be sick, but it can cause systemic inflammatory responses. There is no toxoid, so no vaccine. There is no antitoxin, no treatment, okay? It's palliative care, just dealing with the symptoms. Um, so this is going to be released after the bacteria um, are killed and they shed that outer lining. Remember, this is all gram-negative bacteria and only gram-negative bacteria. You may notice the slide is missing. I'm looking at my time and there's nothing in, on there that is just vitally important. So um, I skipped over it. So don't worry about that. Okay. Um, but our, this is getting long. All right. So um, definitions of infection types. This is very important. Be sure, be sure, be sure that you uh, learn all of these. Okay. Know these definitions. Again, these are terms that we use in our common everyday language, but you need to know the difference, okay? Clinical manifestations of disease as reported by the patient. Those are symptoms, all right? Um, clinical manifestations of the disease as noted by an assessment where you're documenting a measurable thing um, like blood pressure, temperature, those are signs, all right? Uh, things that you would do as in triaging a patient, for instance. And a syndrome, of course, is a disease identified with a certain amount or complex of signs and symptoms grouped together. All right, this is really important here. This is the four signs of inflammation. Sometimes they list it as five. It include loss of function, okay? Um, but all of the textbooks we have used for micro, they do these four. These are the Latin terms here on the right. Rubor, tumor, color, dumor, okay? And that is an A there for, for color. That's fever, pain, almost said stiffness, <laughs> soreness, and swelling, all right? Um, so these are the four cardinal signs of inflammation. Uh, you also will see edema. Edema, of course, is uh, the accumulation of fluid in an affected area. You can have a granuloma and an abscess, which is also a sign of uh, inflammation. A granuloma is where your body is actually trying to wall off and, and, and putting some extra tissue. Um, and inflammatory cells around a microbe, all right? Lymph and dentitis, which is a swollen lymph node. Of course, we're all familiar. That is a good sign. Of, well, maybe not a good sign, but it's an important sign of inflammation. Really important defin definitions here. Emia means blood. Sometimes infections go unnoticed and the host isn't manifesting the disease and doesn't have any noticeable symptoms produced. Um, the microbe can be active in host tissues. The host does not seek medical attention. This is what we are going to call an asymptomatic or subclinical, also sometimes says inapparent infection. Okay, so that's not on here, but that's really important. We have leukocytosis. Leuco means white, cyto means cell. Uh, any isis, Osis is going to be an infectious disease, okay? So that is an increased level of white blood cells. So leukopenia, penia is basically the opposite, which means you have a decrease in white blood cells. Septicemia is a state, and these two uh, are very important to get the technical aspects correct on. Septicemia is the state where microorganisms are actually multiplying 
in the blood and are present in large numbers, if they are not multiplying but are found in the blood, then we call that bacteremia or viremia. Okay, so when they're actually multiplying, it's septicemia. If they're not multiplying, it's bacteremia. Another slide out because this lecture is getting really long. It was another NCLEX prep, prep uh, question. It was a pretty easy one, though, so I think we're all right. Okay, so portals of exit. This is step five for bacteria causing infection. What is a portal of exit? Well, it's kind of the same thing as a portal of entry. Uh, usually they go out the way they came in, but not always. So how do they vacate the host? How do they leave? Um, they're gonna leave via things like flow of fluids, sneezing, blood flow, um, urine, feces, coughing. Skin is a portal of exit. They may leave through the skin, okay? Um, sloughed off tissue, uh, sweat, other excretions through um, the skin there. A microbe needs a portal of exit in order to be successful. Why? Well, it's got to move on to a new host, right? Or it's kind of going to run its course and be dead and not move on, okay? Um, a large number of microbes in these particular products um, like we're talking about urine or sneezing, that's going to increase the likelihood that the pathogen will um, move on to a new host.